Hello everyone, welcome to our um, fisheries presentation. Uh, I'm Laurel Lamb and thank you for attending. I'd like to start by just acknowledging our traditional custodians, the Gabi Gabi, pe Gabi, Gabi people, and pay our respects to the elders past and present. And I'd also like to um, acknowledge other people from Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander descent as well. Thank you. Can I introduce you to Cameron Dixon, um, who will be presenting today? Thank you. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, yes, so my name is Cameron Dixon. Uh, do have the doctor in front, which I'll explain a little bit later. Um, today, I'd like to really explain to you my uh, fairly rich history in fisheries biology and fisheries science. Uh, had lots of very cool experiences. I've been very lucky in my job and in my career path. And uh, hopefully, I can also teach you uh, a few of the, the basic concepts about um, fisheries. It's a, it's a very specialized field. And so it's quite, um, it's, it's quite tricky to, uh, to understand some of the terminology and all those sorts of things. So hopefully uh, I, can, I can bring you some real life experiences to it all. So this picture, first picture here, this is uh, the Spencer Gulf prawn fleet in South Australia. And uh, so it's quite a unique fishery that I've worked with um, for about seven or eight years as the, the lead researcher. And uh, each of these vessels, there are, there are 39 boats in this fleet and they all work um, competitively, but also together. They have a committee and a committee at sea and they, um, they organize all of their fishing um, following surveys and they work out where they're going to go fishing, how long they're going to go fishing for, and then they individually compete. But it's a really great example of how well-managed fisheries in Australia can operate. And these guys are Marine Stewardship Council certified, uh, which some of you may have heard about, and I'll talk about a little bit later. But that was a really great experience working with those guys. Currently, um, I'm employed as a private consultant by the company MRAG Asia Pacific. Um, MRAG do a lot of work in the Pacific Islands and they run the Fisheries Observer Program. So um, the, the large tuna or the tuna that you buy in your tins, um, most of that comes from the Pacific region and it's caught either by Perth Seine vessels. Um, the majority is skipjack tuna caught by Perth Seine vessels. It can also contain some um, yellowfin tuna, which it all, can also be caught by longline, uh, but primarily it's skipjack tuna that goes into the tins. And so MRAG is in charge of the program to put uh, scientific observers out on board each of those boats to, uh, to make sure that the boats are doing the right thing in reporting, et cetera, et cetera. So that's one of the main jobs at, at MRAG Asia Pacific. Um, they've also been involved. I, I don't know whether any of you would have heard, but uh, there's been quite a bit of regulation change in Queensland over the last couple of years. And uh, in particular, um, recently they've developed harvest strategies, which we'll talk about a little bit later. Um, but MRAG did a review about seven or eight years ago of Queensland's fisheries legislation. And as a result of all of that review, they've implemented some really um, fairly major changes. So that's just a little bit about, uh, about MRAG Asia Pacific and the company that I work for. So there's a whole range of careers that you can have in marine science. I've been lucky, you know, in my fisheries, uh, fisheries life, I've, I've experienced quite a few different um, fisheries that I've worked on and, and various tasks. And I've managed to work with a lot of other people as well within the whole marine science um, category. So in particular, like um, there's fisheries and of course, then there's the aquaculture section. Aquaculture is actually growing to a rate where it's almost higher than, uh, than fisheries production. Um, these days on a global basis. Uh, but fisheries and aquaculture really comes down to three key areas. There's the science, which I've uh, dealt with uh, for the majority of my life. There's also the management, so developing policies that fit with the science. Uh, I spent a year as a policy manager developing harvest strategies when I was in South Australia. And then of course, there's the whole production side of things. So you can be on the fishing side, on the, the fishing vessel side. Um, there's also post harvest processing. And then for aquaculture, there's that whole aquaculture side of production. Um, we deal with as fishery scientists, a lot of people in other areas that branch out such as oceanography. So I've uh, run several models, um, oceanographic models where we, we 
take underlying oceanographic processes and then we underpin them with the biology of something like prawns and blue crabs, which I did in South Australia. Um, and, and you try to, for example, project the, where the larvae are going to end up and land to try to start to predict recruitment functions. Those are the types of things where we have interactions um, in marine science between oceanographers and fisheries biologists. Um, then there's also general resource management. And we have a lot of um, amazing places, particularly here in Queensland. We're really spoiled in Queensland. We've got the Great Barrier Reef, of course, and that's the, got the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park Authority, the Australian Institute of Marine Science. Um, and of course, then we have various institutes and government agencies that are uh, both Commonwealth and also state-based. So just a, in, for your understanding, um, in terms of Australian fisheries, uh, they're managed on a jurisdictional basis. So for each of the states, um, they have their own science and uh, science departments and they have their own policy departments. And that's for all um, waters inside of the, um, the sorry, I've forgotten the, the nautical miles, but uh, there, are, there are rules around state waters and outside of that, it's Commonwealth waters. And so we have, we also have a Commonwealth fisheries agency and CSIRO is the primary science provider uh, for Commonwealth fisheries. So there are a large range of, um, of careers and potential careers for anybody that is really interested in marine science. But today I'll talk largely just about my experience in fisheries. Oh, sorry, I shouldn't forget. Um, ENGOs are there. so. Um, ENGOs are environmental non-government non organisations. I work for the World Wildlife Fund. So that's WWF, not the World Wrestling Federation, but the World Wildlife Fund. I work with them for about uh, a year and a half. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit about that program later. The Marine Stewardship Council, MSC, uh, which certifies um, fisheries as sustainable. Uh, those guys are also an environmental non-government organisation and they play a very important role in providing in providing balance to the whole process as a key stakeholder to our fisheries. So I've just got this slide up here that's showing a few, um, a few of the critters that I've had workings with and encounters with. And so I thought I'd just share some stories. Um, of course, whales, sharks, seals, and dolphins, we call them the sexy science of marine science. Um, fisheries like the rock lobster fishery down here, that's more the you know, the hardworking stuff. But certainly in terms of sexy science, a lot of people love love to be able to work in, with all of these animals, um, but there are really great careers. Um, you know, one of my, one of my best mates is, um, leads the, the seal work in, um, in Australia. And so those little guys there, the fur seals, um, I have been on a, an adventure with them for about a week down on Kangaroo Island where we, um, we would, count the pups we would go out and we would literally catch uh catch the pups and then we would tag them and the way that we tagged them was they in their cute little heads these guys are already adults but when they're babies they have all this fur all over the top of their head and they lose that fur at a particular time so uh, each year they've been doing an annual survey where they go in and they catch the pups and they shave um, they shave a strip down the top of the pup's head. It doesn't hurt them at all. They don't get stressed by it, but it clearly identifies them. And so we go in uh, as a team of 15 people uh, on the southern side of Kangaroo Island and we catch these pups, we shave their heads, and then they go back to their mums and dads. And then over the following days, we come back and then we try to count how many pups we see in total. And then from the pups we see in total, we, we have a ratio of shaved heads versus unshaved heads. And from that, because we have a known number of shaved heads, we can have a population estimate. And so they've been doing that in uh, South Australia for the, about the last 30 odd years. And they've been able to track and monitor the progress um, and at times the recovery of seals, because of course we have a bit of a history with seals in Australia where um, we, had, we had a fishery for seals basically many years ago, and a lot of them were also killed um, so the population abundances of seals declined a lot over time, but for the last 20 or 30 years, they've been protected and they've been recovering uh, really well to the point where um, in the fur seal in Southeast Australia is pretty much back to its normal numbers and, uh, and pesters a lot of fishermen, that's for sure. So um, 
I have a story that I can tell you about Wales. So uh, in my early days when I was in Queenscliff um, doing a lot of abalone research, I got to dive with, uh, we, we got to swim with the whales. Now, you're not supposed to just go out and swim with the whales and, and we didn't go and hassle them. But what we did was we saw a whale that was traveling. And so we just jumped in the water well in front of it and, uh, and the whales basically came up to us. And uh, I'll never forget it. It was the most amazing thing in my life. Uh, here you've got a southern right whale with a pup and the pup's the white one, obviously. And there was this pup, as I've just came, come up to it, this pup looking at me from the bottom in about probably 20 feet of water. And, and the pup was just sitting up there watching. And then mum came from a different direction around this way. And she just came right there in front of us. Now, I didn't have a snorkel on. I just had my mask on. And so unfortunately, I didn't get to see her eye. That was the only part that was a disappointment. But so I took a big breath like that when I first saw her. And, uh, and then by the time I put my head back down, her fin just went boom, straight past me, like literally like this far away, her, her big peck fin like that. And, um, I, you know, it was absolutely amazing, obviously. And she swam away and her body and her tail came over. The guy who was the skipper on the boat, thought I was going to die because she pulled her tail out over the top of my head like this, as if a big warning sign. And she could have just gone pop like that at any point in time, but she didn't. She just brought her tail back over and then took off. And I still have that image of that whale's tail heading off into the, into the ocean, burnt into my mind as, you know, it's probably my favorite memory, you know, in my life almost. Um, that interaction was absolutely amazing. So I, uh, I did abalone research for, for the first um, 12 years of my career uh, in Victoria and in South Australia. And of course, the critter on the right, you know, when people talk about sharks, there's only one shark in my view, all the rest of them are just fish. Um, that great white shark is, is the shark. And of course, um, I had to deal with fears of great white sharks because I was diving in very, very sharky waters. And I've heard so many stories. And unfortunately, I've, I know a couple of people that have been taken by sharks uh, but, you know, the reality is we're in their environment and, uh, and you need to be careful. And um, we, yeah, I was fortunate enough to never see one. I'm sure that they saw me. Uh, I spent 1,200 hours underwater uh, in those sorts of habitats. So I'm certain that they saw me, but I never saw one of them. And uh, until a few years ago when I actually went uh, down to Port Lincoln and did a shark dive. I never got to see one underwater, but I got to saw one from, from the boat. And I was like, that's close enough. That's nice. So um, anyway, my, my wife was very relieved when I actually uh, stopped abalone diving and I started working on prawns, which I'll talk about a bit later. I've also had uh, one dive with dolphins. You don't get to swim with dolphins very often, uh, but one time they came up and, and had a swim with me, which was really, really cool. Uh, but certainly lots of experiences with seals. And one of the benefits of um, being a marine biologist was that I knew where all the good crayfish were. And uh, so I caught lots of crayfish and, uh, and I've had a very spoilt life eating fantastic Australian seafood, that's for sure. So that's just a few stories about my background. So as I said before, I've, um, I have a PhD and I did my PhD in abalone research. And so uh, here is, this is green lip abalone habitat. And so there's my catch bag, uh, just doing scuba diving. And that's actually a green lip abalone that I'm about to pick up there uh, in those habitats. Now, I did that PhD with the University of Melbourne. And here is a little bit more uh, typical of, um, well, it's, I shouldn't say typical. This is actually very, uh, this is an excellent area of, uh, of abalone habitat. So it's very difficult to tell from the screen, but on the right hand side here, that is a sheer wall. And then it comes down at an angle on the other side. And all of those abalone aggregate there because it's an excellent algae trap. So these guys are herbivores. They're a, they're a snail, an ocean snail. And as the seaweed comes down, it traps into those areas. And one of the abalone will grab a piece of drift seaweed and then all the others grab it and they all get a feed. So what we find is that they tend to aggregate into these areas. And the aggregation of abalone is really important because um, they are a broadcast spawner. So when they spawn, they release, the males release their eggs and the females release their eggs and they have to mix. So 
you can't take too many abalone because if you thin them out too much, they won't get any spawning um, potential being able to occur. So the aggregations of abalone are very important. So an abalone diver would come along here. Back in the old days, those were worth about $50 a piece. Like every abalone there would have been worth about $50. The prices have dropped a little bit since abalone aquaculture has come in, but an abalone diver would come in and he would take probably three quarters of those abalone um, that you see there, whatever was the legal size, put him in his bag and move on. But the good thing about abalone is that actually others will move in because that's a great spot. It's like, you know, that's the primo location in terms of, um, in terms of habitat. And so uh, if somebody moves out of the house, somebody else will move in. So that's sort of how abalone operate a bit. Um, in my PhD, I, uh, I did uh, an experiment with juvenile abalone. And so all of mine was about density dependence. And I'll try to explain density dependence a little bit later. Uh, right. we, we tagged, you can see um, potentially on those two very small little abalone that you might be able to see up on the screen there, um, they have very little tags on them. So these abalone, when they started out, were no bigger than my thumbnail. And we had to glue little identification tags onto their back. And then we released them into all of these habitats. And I released them on a range of habitats at a range of different densities. And then we followed their growth and estimated their mortality. And so that was one of the key experiments that I did in my PhD. Uh, and here's just another picture. This is a, a abalone. They are an amazing animal because it's very hard to get them off the rocks. They, that foot just grabs hold and will not let go. Um, so they don't have very many predators, but this is one of them. This little whelk learned how to sneak up onto an abalone and get its proboscis in underneath them. And, uh, and once they get in under, underneath like that, um, takes them about half an hour, an hour, but uh, they put their poison in and then the abalone's died. So I've only ever seen that um, on two occasions. So it's pretty rare, um, but yeah, very cool. So as I said before, um, when I finished my uh, abalone diving career, I was very lucky. Um, uh, There's a true story. My wife literally said, I'm sick of eating abalone. Do you think you can find some?" something tastier and three days later I got a job offer to run the research program for prawns in South Australia it was I was pretty stoked she should have put it out earlier but anyway so I spent um, the next eight years researching um, prawns and blue crabs all right so that's enough about me and my stories let's get on to a little bit of fisheries uh, fisheries 101 I'll call it so what I'm trying to do here is provide you a little bit of context about uh, how important Australia is in, in global fisheries terms. The reality is we are a really minor, minor seafood player. Yeah. We produce only about 150,000 tonnes, which is less than 0.2% of the global seafood production. It's pretty amazing. We're such a large country and we have such a huge coastline. Um, but the reality is our coastlines are, are actually very nutrient poor. Now, in many other parts of the world, they have cold water upwellings that um, throw up a lot of uh, nutrient rich water and then phytoplankton will feed on that nutrient rich water and then sardines or some other low trophic level species will come in and eat those. And you end up with highly productive systems where there's you know, literally thousands and millions of tons uh, of seafood being produced. In Australia, we have very few upwellings. We have one that's a regular upwelling down in South Australia. And on the back of that is Australia's largest fishery, which is a sardine fishery out of South Australia. And they catch around 30,000 tonnes a year. Um, but, and, and that's out of our 150,000 tonnes, 30,000 tonnes of that is sardines. And most of those actually get fed to bluefin tuna in the pens in, in South Australia. So that gives you a little bit of, a, a little bit of an understanding in the context. But, even though we don't have a huge volume, the reality is that we have um, a really species rich, high value fisheries like rock lobster, like abalone, all those sorts of things. So, so we don't have a great, deal of, um, a great deal of volume, but we do have great diversity and high value. So, but part of our problem with that, and I'll jump down to the export earnings side of things, is that most of that high value product ends up getting shipped overseas because that's where the higher prices and premiums are paid. So the reality is when you see that picture, you start thinking, well, you know, how much are we, how much as Australians do we actually eat? And that's why we need to import quite a bit of fish. Anyway, 
again, context, New Zealand catches more than three times what Australia does. Despite its size, um, the reality is they have a lot of cold water upwellings and some amazing fisheries production out of New Zealand. So hokey alone, which is a product that you'll find in most of the, the supermarkets, et cetera, it's a white fish product um, that produces around 120,000 tonnes. So almost, almost the amount of Australia's total volume is just one species that comes out of New Zealand. So, but then we jump up again and... And as I was explaining before about the, the upwellings, the most famous upwelling is in off Peru and the Peruvian Anchoveta fishery, um, it, to annual catches have been up to 8.3 million tons. And the maximum catch was 13 million tons, but that actually led to, that was a part of the downfall of the fishery and it crashed, but it has recovered. And, uh, and, and it's a good, it's well managed now. Um, but just to, just to see the scale of the amount from one species in one system compared to what we produce across our whole country. It's quite mind blowing. Now, coming back to this thing around the export again, our apparent consumption of seafood is about 15 kilos per year. Now the, the world consumption is 19, uh, but in places like Asia, um, it's, you know, it's way above that. I don't have the figures for it, but certainly you know, in, in places like Asia, subsistence fishing is a really key part of their lives and, and seafood is such an important part of their lives. Um, but, but even at our 15 kilos per person, we cannot produce enough Australian seafood to feed our population. And most of it goes overseas, as we say. Um, so imports actually account for about 66% of our total consumption. And we get a lot of that from New Zealand, but we also get a lot of that from other parts of the world. So, and I'll talk a little bit about some of that and sustainability a little bit later on. It's part of my other work. Um, the Marine Stewardship Council. And so that's the, one of the NGOs that I was talking about a little bit before. Um, they produce, well, they have this certification process, which is about trying to identify and, and label, uh, eco-label, um, sustainable seafood products. There are literally hundreds of different types of eco-labels out there about fishery sustainability. But this one has been proven to stand over and above all others by a very long way. And so it was actually developed uh, largely by Australian scientists and Australian management systems. And it's a, it's a fantastic thing. And it's something that I have worked in now for about the last six years. I'm one of the assessors. The way that it works is that the MSC has created a system by which fisheries are assessed against. And my company, MRAG, um, uh, it's actually the MRAG US office is what's called a CAB, a certifying agency body. And uh, we independent of the MSC, we assess fisheries. Um, when a client comes to us and says, we want to, we want to get the tick, um, we assess their fishery against the MSC standard. And it's all very independent. And at the end of the day, we give them a pass or a fail. And it's, it's about an improvement program. So at the end of the day, they, they, they need to get a pass overall, but you identify weaknesses in their management system and, and their, their entire system, which covers the stock that they catch, and it covers also their environmental responsibility. So what bycatch are they getting? What interactions do they have with endangered, threatened and protected species? And then what policy, uh, sorry, what impacts on the habitat and what impacts on the ecosystem they have. So that's called principle two. And then the third part is to make sure that they have a management system or a policy system um, that is robust and is able to deliver on that science and that protection. So that's, um, that's how the MSC certification standard operates. And it's been a big part of my life over the last few years. I've, I've assessed quite a few fisheries. So I'm go I've just explained there before I've actually got to it, but I'll leave that up for a second. So principle one, sustainable stocks and harvest strategy. I'll talk about that a bit later. Principle two, ecologically sustainable stocks, non-target species, which includes bycatch. Uh, ETPs is endangered, threatened, and protected species. So such as seals, sharks, all of those, all of those critters. Habitats, you know, we need to make sure that if it's a trawl fishery, that it's not trawling over reefs, et cetera, and that it's not trawling and damaging too much of the habitat, that it stays largely like a farm and only 
only fishes within known areas so that they're limiting the impacts on the, on the ecosystem. Um, and then the ecosystems overall. And if I can explain the ecosystems overall, um, we've just talked about the upwellings in Peru. So there's, there's obviously in a, in a large ecosystem like that, you have a number of things like birds and high level predators, et cetera, that rely on those anchovies as well as the fishermen. And there needs to be a balance. We'll talk about maximum sustainable yield a little bit later on, but you can take a certain amount of fish out and, and those fish can be ongoing caught. You know, you can catch 20% of the stock or whatever every year, depending on the productivity. And you can do that on an ongoing basis, but ecosystem balance means that you need to make sure that you're not taking too many fish from all of the other animals that rely on that within the ecosystem. So it's not just these days, you know, it used to be just about stock sustainability. Now it's very much about ecosystem sustainability and how much fish we can take in terms of that. So very important part of the MSC process. And then finally, as I said, the legal system and the fishery specific management is the other key role. So I'm going to talk in terms of those MSC principles because it's a really good way to explain things. So principle one is around the target stock. And so the next few slides, I want to talk about density dependence, which is where I did my PhD, um, sustainability and the sustainable harvest of stocks. So MSY, et cetera, that ecologically sustainable harvest that I talked about and a few concepts that you would have already heard about around overfishing harvest strategies and population dynamics. Okay, so I'm coming back to this. It's my favorite, my favorite slide and my favorite abalone picture. Um, but density dependence is what I, what I studied. And without density dependence, there would not be sustainable fisheries. So um, I will, I'll provide a bit of a demonstration in a minute about how it all works. But some of the factors that density dependence are affected by is, is around growth and reproduction and survival. And density dependence takes two forms. One is called compensatory density dependence, and the other is called depensatory density dependence. So I'll attempt to explain both of those. Um, all right. So here's where I get the chocolates. So you have to follow me around. Um, all right. Because you didn't come in the audience, you miss out on chocolate and food. So, all right. What I've got here is resources. This is the food resources available to this stock of animals. But now my stock is the audience. Say, so, oh, it's not going to turn around. You don't get to see the lovely audience. I'm sorry. Um, so we have we have some we have four people here in front of me directly, and few hiding up the back. So enough food resources for one each. So in a full population, I'm going to throw around a chocolate to each person. Everybody gets a feed. All right. So everybody, we've spread the resources. Everybody's got one chocolate each. But now I'm a fisherman and I come through and I take out half of the population. Well, next time the food comes around, all of a sudden, we've only got two left. And so they've got twice the amount of resources. So you're the winner. You're the winner. Sorry, you guys were fished out. Um, so what, what, this, what I'm saying here is that um, the additional, by, by removing uh, some of the population, all of a sudden there is additional resources uh, for the remaining population. And what happens then is that the population compensates. The numbers have come down. And so with those additional resources, now you can grow more. Now you can spend more energy into reproduction. Now by the extra growth, you're actually a lot stronger and you've got a greater chance of survival. It's the only way that we have sustainable fisheries. Without compensatory density dependence, what would happen is we would just be removing fish and they wouldn't be growing back fast enough. But the fish, the, the fish stock itself actually compensates for the lower numbers because it's got more resources. And so it affects these three life history parameters. And so what we can actually do, and this is how things occur. You know, let, let's say that 
um, something happened to one of the fish stocks and a disease came through. Exactly the same thing happens. The natural response of the stock is our population's are down, but we've still got the same resources. So this is how we compensate. And abalone is a great example because they don't move too far. And what happens, I did a tagging experiment where uh, I removed half of the abalone um, from a large area and then we measured their growth. And then we had a control site that was left at the original density. And we found that by removing half of them, the others literally grew 33% more. So, you know, it's a measurable thing. And without that, like I said, we would not be able to have sustainable fisheries. So that's where it leads into the concept of um, maximum sustainable yield. And I'll come back to that in a minute. Uh, Depensatory density dependence though, is, uh, it's the other side of the coin. A population can compensate, but only for so long. And there are a number of depensatory mechanisms that can occur. And so one of them, and I used this example before, um, is that if we thinned out that population of abalone too much, and you start to think about it in terms of, this is a, a really highly aggregated area, but the reality is that a lot of them lives in twos and threes and fours. But if you take too many of them away, then all of a sudden you really start impacting on that fertilization success. And when you start fishing abalone fisheries down to about 20 to 30% of their original biomass, the total biomass, um, compensation works all the way until you hammer them too hard. And then all of a sudden they just start dropping off really badly because fertilization success doesn't occur. And I have this, I, I have this picture in my mind. Um, I'll, I'll share this story. In the US, they don't, they don't have managed fisheries like ours. Um, we have quotas and we, we say, you can only take this much. You know, you can only take this much. You can only take this much. It was pretty much open slather in American fisheries. And they have destroyed effectively eight populations of, or eight different species of abalone. And it was really sad to see the catches go up like this. And then all of a sudden they start dropping off and deep and satiry, or deep and satiry effects come in and the population crashes. And literally now you go out there and you only find a few of each of these species, two or three of them went onto the endangered list. It was that bad. So they've had to close them down. But when you looked at the history of abalone fishing, they, this guy plotted it beautifully on a, on a curve. I'm going to show it on here. So he had a timeline and the first species, the catches went up and then crashed. They moved to the next species, catches went up and crashed. They moved to the next species, catches went up and crashed. And they did that literally for eight species in a row. Um, and unfortunately after that, then they started moving on to sea urchins. So, you know, different parts of the world take very different approaches to fisheries management. Uh, but I, I'm pleased to say that America's really got its act together over the last 20 or 30 years and doesn't, doesn't do that. It, it follows most of these other good concepts, but certainly abalone was a very, very bad one for them. Okay, maximum sustainable yield. So uh, hopefully you guys have, have heard a bit about uh, this over, uh, over your course, but I'm gonna give you my version, my version of that. So what we have here is um, fishing effort or fishing mortality. So the way I want you to think about it is that this is an increasing number of boats, all right? And it doesn't matter what type of fishing gear it is, but the more, more boats we have, the more fishing effort that we have. Yield is our total amount of catch. Now, when we start out and we've only got one fishing boat, he goes out there and he has a great time because we haven't caught any fish in this population yet. Um, there's hundreds and thousands of fish out there and he goes and has a great time. As we catch more boats, as we, sorry, as we build in more boats, what we can see is that all of a sudden those boats are having to start to share the catch. And what's happening in reality is that that population is starting to decline and compensation's kicking in to try to hold it back, but that population is beginning to decline. But the reality is they're sharing the catch now. And so as we move up the curve, for every extra bit of effort that we put in, we're getting less catch, if you can understand that. And then we reach this theoretical space that's right at the top that says that this is the maximum that compensation will allow us to be able to harvest. And we call that point 
maximum sustainable yield. Now in the real world, maximum sustainable yield isn't a perfect number. It bounces around quite a bit um, due to a number of factors about recruitment, et cetera, et cetera. But it's a really, really useful tool for a fisheries biologist to try to set benchmarks about where we want our stocks to be. They've done a lot of studies about maximum sustainable yield and they've modeled a lot of fisheries and the numbers that they use for maximum sustainable yield as, a, as an average is 40% of the original biomass. So if we have a stock that was a million tons, then the maximum sustainable yield will be when the stock is harvested down to about 400,000 tons. So 40% of that original or what we call virgin biomass. So that is a theoretical thing. It bounces up around and down a little bit depending on species, um, but, but it's, a, it's a really good benchmark point for us. And that's where we call it fully fished. Bunch of other lines here. So I will come back to this side first, maximum economic yield. Now I mentioned before about Queensland's fisheries. Queensland's fisheries has set these very, um, uh, what's very conservative targets, and they're actually past maximum economic yield. But in most fisheries, let's go to Asia. The reality is in Asia, you want to be maximizing your employment and you want to be maximizing your production. So maximum sustainable yield in Asia is absolutely the ideal target. That's where you would love to be because you want to catch as much fish as you can. Reality is most of them are overfished, unfortunately, but, but we're getting there. I'm helping in a number of different places and um, they're, they're getting there and improving their fisheries management. But in Australia, um, many of our fisheries, like the northern prawn fishery, are actually fished back on this left-hand side. And the reality is that the further we go back on the left-hand side, there are some real benefits. We don't care about that extra little bit of catch. See, the extra little bit of catch up top might be only 10%, but all of a sudden we're using half the amount of effort and that makes us a hell of a lot more profitable. So that's called the point of maximum economic yield. And that depends on how much it costs you to catch your fish um, versus how much that yield is. Now, the good thing about maximum economic yield is that it's a far more conservative target and your stocks are higher. So they might be sitting at 60%, or you know, the theoretical is somewhere between 50 and 60% of the original biomass. So you're leaving more fish in the water. And that's great for recreational fishermen. It's great for everybody else. So in a place like Australia, um, maximum economic yield is the target. And in Queensland, we've gone even more conservative. I've gone past that to like B, um, B60, I think is it. They want 60% of the original biomass. Going to take a little bit of time to get there, but that's, that's where they've agreed to go. Okay. Now, these terms MSY and then maximum economic yield MEY, um, we use those, we, current, we call those target reference points. And those are generally, and we'll explain in the harvest strategies a little bit later, um, how those target reference points operate. But Queensland has set a target reference point. See your hand up. Cool. Queensland has set that target reference point of um, B60 or economic status. So, and that's a part of our harvest strategy. We have a question. Baseline biomass, so virgin biomass. So generally that is uh, derived from a population model. So I will come to population models a little bit later. So what I'll do is I'll, I'll hold that one off until then. Very good question though. So very good question. All right. If we come down to the right-hand side of the curve, now, once we get past maximum sustainable yield and we keep adding boats, adding effort, we begin overfishing because we've gone past the point you know, of, of being at where our target wants to be. Now, overfishing is defined differently in different places. So some of you may have seen the status of Australian fish stocks, for example, um, report, which is a large report that looks at and summarizes all of the sustainability of Australian fish stocks. Now, where... This, this, that's called the SAFs report. I'll refer it to as the SAFs report, status of Australian fish stocks. Where the SAFs report calls sustainable fisheries is anywhere that is half above half of MSY. 
So MSY was B was 40% of the biomass, and that's the target reference point. When it gets to 20% of the biomass, which is where I've ended the line here, that is the limit reference point, okay? Because we don't want it to go below that. Because once it starts going below that, decompensatory density dependent processes can kick in and we're at too much risk of crashing the stock. So we never want to let it go below the limit. We want to be at the target, but we don't want to go below the limit. Now in the SAFs, you'll see lots of green stocks that are sustainable. The reality is in the SAFs, anywhere above the limit reference point, they call sustainable. In the MSC, the only thing they call sustainable is once you get to MSY. It's a very different story. MSC is far more conservative and want you to be there. You can be MSC certified and be down above 20%. That's okay. But you have to have a plan that demonstrates that in the next few years, you're going to get to MSY. So it, it's a different way of looking at it. Um, and it's a different, there's different terminology in the SAFs. They'll use limit reference point, but in MSC, they use what's called called the point of recruit impairment. But effectively, we do not want to go below that 20% zone because it gets too dangerous and might crash. Did I see a hand? Yep. Is the MEY always lower than MSY in terms of those two efforts and years? Absolutely. So that that is, although this is theoretical, that rule absolutely applies because for MEY, you have to, you're heading back and looking to maximize, like I say, the dollars and the cents. It, it's just always going to be that way. Um, it, but in terms of where the stock sits, so, so yes, it's always to the left, but in terms of the stock, when you think about it, um, so it's 40% of that original biomass or 60% of it gone is MSY. And it's closer somewhere between 50 and 60%. So in other words, 40 or 50% of it removed. So uh, for MEY, so yes, far more conservative target reference point. Another good question. Is that it? Okay, <laughs> keep going. All right. Speaking of which, so here is the SAFs. This is the uh, status of, a, of Australian fish stocks. So um, I'm not sure whether any of you guys or whether all of you guys have actually been to see it, but it is worth having a look at that website um, it will explain uh, exactly about target and limit reference points and where Australia's stocks uh, from all around the coast, all the states and the Commonwealth, um, where those stocks sit in terms of their uh, stock status. So here is the summary from the SAFs report. As I said to you, um, the sustainable being the green here, um, is 91 in Australia, 91% of the total catch um, is termed as sustainable under the status of Australian fish stocks. We have only a handful of stocks, so four of them being 1% that is termed depleting. Now, on that curve, depleting means that it is um, still on the bottom end of that line. So it's not quite at 20%, but it's on the way down. Recovering means that it can be um, around that 20% mark, but it's actually on the way back up. And depleted means that it's below 20%. So, and then we have the undefined and negligible. But you can actually see that there are quite a few stocks, um, 36 stocks out of the 477. So about eight or 9% of Australia's stocks that are actually in that real depleted range. And I can tell you that there is probably only a handful of them, um, probably again, another 10% that are probably fished at MSY or MEY. And most of those actually get MSC certification because they are so well managed, like the Northern Prawn Fishery, like the Spencer Gulf Prawn Fishery. Um, there's a number of other prawn fisheries in Australia that have been MSC certified, but yeah. That's a little bit of a snapshot for you about where Australia's stock status is. So I'll attempt to come back to the virgin biomass question as I go through this, but here's a little bit of stuff around fisheries population dynamics and fisheries data. So the next series of slides are going to try to show you what actually happens once you start fishing a fish stock. So on the 
bottom size here, we have small fish. And over here, we have our monsters. And up the top there, we have the frequency. So the count increases along the way. So you can see that in this stock, the mean population size is somewhere around the, you know, the 90 millimeter size. So that's where around half, that's where around that mean, mean is. But we have some very large fish in there up to 200 centimeters. As we begin to fish down a population, we generally target the biggest ones and we're catching all of those biggest ones. And what actually happens is that over time, the more and more fish that we catch, we, we truncate this population. We end up losing a lot of the big ones and we have mostly smaller ones. Now, compensatory, deep, compensatory processes are, are pumping in more fish and it's sort of growing some of them, but this is what we see. And then we get down to a point where a fish stock um, can be in real trouble when it's down to the 20% mark or whatever, where what we're actually having is very few large population, uh, large fish in the population. And these guys are often our big mummers and they're the ones who are producing all of the eggs and all the babies. So we can get ourselves into real trouble. That's why we want to, don't want to go and fish a stock too hard past 20% because it starts to look like that and you start to get in a little bit of trouble. So this is where we do things. We like, we gather fisheries data so that we can monitor the sizes of fish in the catch, et cetera, over time. Really important. So how do we assess fish stocks? Well, we do, we use data and, and we conduct stock assessments. So there's various elements to a, to a stock assessment and understanding, and, and we basically we develop a population model to try to simulate what's going on in that stock. The basic fundamental part of any fisheries model is understanding the biology. Now here, we have our rock lobster, and here we have a female rock lobster with her clutch of eggs. Those eggs um, turn into, I think, Norpoli larvae. Um, and then from, oh, sorry, Phylozoa, I think. Sorry, been a while since I've done this one. Uh, and then this stage turns into our little baby cray. Now, the reality is that process takes 18 months to get to that size. From the eggs being released, to that size takes 18 months. So they are at the whim of the current for all of that period of time. You know, they're, they're feeding on plankton and all those sorts of things, but they're a part of like krill basically, you know, just a part of that system out at the mercy of the ocean for 18 months. So here's where things like oceanography really kick in. And there's a story associated with this. The West Australian rock lobster fishery was the very first ever MSC certified fishery in the world. It traveled along beautifully and it's fantastic, great, great fishery. But climate change has influenced the Lewin current and the Lewin current had been operating for years, had set up all these you know, great sites. There was a fantastic understanding of where all those babies ended up. They had monitoring programs everywhere where they're catching the little babies like this and they could predict exactly how many crayfish were coming through into the adult population. And then all of a sudden, climate change started stuffing up the Lewin current. And all of a sudden, the little babies weren't appearing on the rock lobster settlers anymore. Panic mode set in. What is going on here? So they worked with oceanographers and they began to try to understand. But you know what? The biology of the animal beat science at the end of the day. There was panic, absolute panic. And there was a few years where we didn't see anything. They, the catches had to drop, you know, everything was going into real, into real danger space. But what's happened, and it's taken them a while to actually understand where they've all ended up, but they've ended up in new habitats. And largely they're still going back to the same fishing grounds. So the recruitment grounds have changed and the dynamics have changed, but the stock has bounced back. And it's not quite to where it was at its peak, but it's still pretty amazing. But that just gives you a little understanding about how things like climate change and influencing the oceanographics, et cetera, can really mess with a stock. And we've seen a hell of a lot of change in terms of species distributions and all those sorts of things with climate change. That's a whole nother story that I won't go into. So back to our rock lobster, our next step. So we understand the biology about them now. We understand, uh, and what we try to do is, is gather um, in this fishery in South Australia is, is gather those little babies. When we put out these cray collectors, gather the little babies because they give us an index of what's coming into the future. And so over time, as you get your babies index and you get your adult index, which you either get through fishing or through surveys, you can link the two 
and you understand how long it takes for them to grow, et cetera, et cetera. And you start building up an understanding of how the fishery operates. I'll show a little bit about models in a minute, but I don't want to get into it because it's fairly detailed. Um, but here is um, the South Australian rock lobster fishery. Now, it also had some major impacts um, from, from the environment. At one point in time, the fishery was absolutely flying. The black bars are the catches in tons. The red line is the amount of um, effort, fishing effort in terms of pots. So I don't know if you guys understand how a rock lobster is caught. They have these huge pots like this. They put a bait in the pot, they drop it down onto the bottom and the rock lobsters crawl into the pot to get the bait and then they can't get out. Pretty simple stuff. So that red line was the number of pots the black line, the catch. You can see the black lines were bouncing up and down there for quite a while, and then they go stable. That's where the blue line kicks in. The blue line was where they first implemented the TACC, a total allowable commercial catch. So that TACC was, you can see, was quite flat at around um, 1,700 tonnes for from 1993, uh, bounced up a little bit around the 2000s. Now, what I want you to look at there is we've got stable catch, but look what's happening to the effort. The effort drops a lot. The reality was when they brought in the TACC and stopped all the bouncing up and down, the fishery actually got more productive. And so they were catching lots more rock lobsters. The environment was pretty good, obviously, for recruitment and all those sorts of things. But they were catching so many rock lobsters, they needed less than half the effort than what they'd done two or three years before. So now they were catching it with only 9,000 pot lifts instead of 18,000 pot lifts. So it, it was a far more economic way for them to fish. Um, things were going great. But all of a sudden, look what happened to the line. The line starts going back up. It was starting to take more effort. Now, here we've got a fixed catch. So there's only one thing going on in this fishery, and that is that the productivity's dropped a bit for whatever reason. It was environmental, quite clearly, that drove it. But Maybe there was a good recruitment period of all those crayfish coming through, but then it stopped. And so the effort started going up. But because we had a total allowable catch, you know, they actually bumped up the effort there in the, early, the catch in the early days. They did it for a few years, but then they went to a point where they're going, oh, this isn't looking so good. We're catching as few as what we were before. We need to drop the catch. Now, it took a bit of a bun fight, I can tell you, to make from, from the scientists to make the, the fishermen uh, accept this and to make the policy managers accept it. But they, the, the policy managers drove down the TACs. And what happened to the effort? Ever since then, they have got it right and the effort dropped dramatically. Um, and it's continued to go down and now it's more and more efficient. Now, this stock is managed through a population model. And, and my friend Rick McGarvey in South Australia um, does a great job running this population model and it's very well tuned. And they were following this and providing scientific advice back here saying, you need to drop the quota, you need to drop the quota. It took two or three years before they did it, but the proof is in the pudding. Quite clear there that the productivity of the fishery increased. Of course, the fishermen were scared because they're catching less fish. But you know what happened? It was crazy. The price went up by 20% in the year that they dropped it. So they made just as much money. Um, they still won't, they won't thank the scientists for that. But anyway. All right. A part of, this is a part of my work um, that I did as the lead scientist on Blue Crab Program, feeding into these population models. Um, a lot of the time, so we have all this theory about how, you know, how much they grow and how the babies are coming in, et cetera, et cetera. But what we actually need to do is gather data every year to benchmark against the theory. And we call that the fitting process on these population models. All right. Now, this is where I'll come in a minute back to zero uh back to the initial biomass so in here what i did was i set up a survey this is spencer golf on the left sorry the spe where the spencer golf bit is that all should be blue sorry it's a it's a poor slide um in actual fact i think something's gone on with the picture but anyway you can see this is kangaroo island and here is cape jervis adelaide's up there so this is golf st vincent and up here it's spencer golf and it goes all the way up very unique systems these because there's very little fresh water and so what you find is it's real high salinity up in the northern parts of the gulf and and um you get a, a real range of species but prawns in theory shouldn't be down that far south but because of this hypersaline environment it gets really warm during the summer prawns and crabs thrive so 
Most of the fish is, are up in the north. And what we did is we set up these surveys and we used a fishing boat and they would go out to the same place at the same time each year. And we would go out there and we would throw our pots out and then we'd catch crabs and we would record that information. And you can actually monitor over time an independent estimate of the biomass. Now it's not the total biomass like we're gonna to come to, but it's an estimate of relative biomass. And if you get rid of all the variables by going back to the same place at the same tide and all that sort of stuff, you get quite a good measure that takes away a lot of the variance that can occur. And it can be quite reliable in terms of are things going up or are things going down? Now, how we often fit um, that information is you, you've got your catches, you've got your understanding of the biology that goes on in a population model. I'll show some of the elements of a population model shortly, um, but we fit these type of data to it and the model sort of adjusts and says, yeah, okay, here's where we think things are. And what we usually use is, is an estimate of current biomass. And so our current biomass for a fishery might be sitting at 30% of the original biomass, somewhere between the limit and the target reference point. Now, we're probably fairly comfortable. In Australia, we call that sustainable. Um, in an MSC fishery, we'd want to make it improve. But the way that, the way that we estimate uh, is the model projects backwards in time, basically. It tracks the only known parts of the parts of the fishery later on where you've been gathering data. So it tracks and it estimates where things bounce up and down. It calculates all of that biology, and then it basically back calculates to estimate how many fish there were in the original, uh, at the original time. It is a theoretical estimate. It's not perfect. And the reality is that even our MSYs are quite a theoretical um, estimate. But the truth is, it's far better than nothing. And when you monitor regularly and you estimate annually, then you're able to watch things bounce up and down. And if you have them wrong and they're heading in the wrong direction, you know that you've got an issue in your model and you, you'll test it and you'll try to fix it and improve it and adjust it over time. Fishery science is not an exact science. Um, just a quick diversion on that. A lot of science in population biology understanding around the world, including terrestrial animals, has come from fishery science. The reality is that fishery science was the thing to do many years ago. We had guru fishery scientists um, all the way through the 60s, 70s, 80s, and 90s. And the reason is, these are populations that are under the water. We can't see what's going on. A bird population, far easier to measure. Cows in a paddock, uh, who cares? Fisheries modeling, in those early days and, and understanding population biology um, was the area of fisheries scientists. So some of the great science in that has come from that history and, and it still stays true today. You know, there really hasn't been much advance. The majority of these things around maximum sustainable yield, all that sort of stuff have come from these brilliant mathematicians um, who, who did fisheries science. And, and really we haven't, you know, modeling, computer modeling and simulation and data and all that sort of stuff has helped a hell of a lot, but those concepts were already there and tried and tried and true and tested. All right. So here's just some of the examples of the types of information that can go into a fisheries uh, model. And again, I'm not going to go into too much detail, but the length at age. So for example, in fish, we can, uh, you take out the ear bone and it's a bit like counting the rings on a, on a tree trunk. Um, you can tell how old a tree is by how many annual rings that it lays down. A fish otolith is an ear bone that they have, and it's exactly the same as that. And if you take the fish uh, otolith out and you cut it and you section it, you can actually count the rings and estimate how old that fish is. So when you have an estimate of how old it is and how large it is, you can actually have this length at age key. And so we can test things like density dependence by looking at different length at age keys over time because they will change. So as you fish a population down and they grow faster, you'll find that younger fish are now um, at a larger size, those types of things. Fish maturity at age, really important one. Things like size limits are based on this stuff. So what we find is that um, a, at, at a certain, you know, like in a human population at a certain age, um, the average age, people become um, fertile and, and capable of reproducing, but that varies with 
a fair bit of distance around you. The same thing occurs in fish stocks. And it's really important to understand what size those animals are when they become reproductively active and what the range is around that because things like size limits are put in to protect, to make sure that those animals at least have the chance to get up and be reproductively active for a set for a year or two before they're able to be harvested. Numbers at age, um, it's the same as the length at age thing there, really just with counts instead, but from that we can determine things like natural mortality rates, weighted age, again, very similar. Now, mature biomass, um, this is a term that is, is often used instead of the total biomass. So again, I won't go into the detail on it, uh, but it's often substituted to say that we will have maintain at least 40% of the mature biomass rather than the total biomass. Um, really, that's just about ensuring that there is enough reproductive activity going on to maintain the population. Um, and total biomass, that's just another, that obviously, as before, um, that's that's what we're actually talking about when we're talking about what's the, uh, the overall biomass of the fishery. And so total biomass will change over time as you catch and as it compensates, et cetera. So those are just a few of the concepts. Um, it's a fisheries model is a, a fisheries modeling is a very specific area. Anybody that, that loves statistics and loves computing and et cetera, et cetera, but has an interest in this stuff, fisheries modelers are, are quite rare. Um, they, you know, a lot of the time you need to be a statistical genius. Um, most of the fisheries modelers that I work with, uh, have been great. They need to, they're not biologists though. A lot of the time they're brilliant scientists and brilliant mathematicians, but you need to be able to work with a fisheries scientist to be able to put a biological reality to a lot of this stuff. Um, but it's, it's a really important area of fishery science. All right. Harvest strategies. How are we going for time? I think it must be for heaps. Okay, cool. Um, harvest strategies are the government's way to control fishing effort. Um, it sets out all of these decision rules for the fishery to harvest the stocks sustainably. And so you've got all the concepts of the science now behind um, stock sustainability. Harvest strategies are the way that the government will implement these policies to make sure that they're, that they're stuck with. And if I could give you an example um, from my experience, harvest strategies have really only come in in the last 10 to 15 years as formal rules. What the fishermen used to love to do, nothing more that they would love to do than have a fight with the fisheries policy makers. So the scientists would pre present their data. We go back 15 years ago, scientists would present their data and they would say, Things aren't looking so great. We really got to reduce the catches. And the fishermen would just get in there and go, they got no idea what they're talking about, blah, 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 and everything. And no, we can't do this. We can't do that. There was fights all the time, arguments. And the policy, poor policy guy stuck in the middle trying to understand something balanced between politics and science and whatever. Now, the important part about harvest strategies is that they are agreed by everybody. And when you have your, um, your targets met, like, you know, uh, let's you go back to the biomass again. If our biomass falls below 20%, there is no decision to be made other than we are closing the fishery or reducing effort or whatever it is. It's a decision that is automatic based on the information that's already there and it takes the fight away. I love it. Most people love it. Um, fishermen didn't love it to start with, but in the end, it actually gives them business certainty. So many of them have been you know, very, very happy with the harvest strategies that get implemented. They can also understand them and they are, they are uh, invited to be a key stakeholder in the decision-making and the development of harvest strategies. And that's really critical. So the Commonwealth fisheries, remember I said before, we have state fisheries and we have our Commonwealth. The Commonwealth uh, fisheries are very, very well managed across the board. Um, there's a lot of resources that get spent in, in our Commonwealth fisheries. And, and the Commonwealth fisheries agency is AFMA. Um, the Australian Fisheries Management Authority and, and AFMA. There's also uh, the Department of um, Agricultural Water Resources uh, and, and Department of um, or DAF, Department of Agriculture, Forestry and Fishing. Um, they, they've all contributed to the development of the Commonwealth Fisheries Harvest Strategy Policy and Guidelines. But um, not going to go into too much detail about that, but it's certainly worth looking at. Um, and I'll come back, I'm using the example that we had before to try to explain. 
the decision rules that you might set up for a harvest strategy are here. So for example, if we use um, now, normally what we'd be looking at here is the ratio of the catch versus the effort. But in this fishery example, we, we could see when that effort dropped down, things were going great. And then when the red line comes back up, things aren't looking so good because it's, it's a lot more hard work to catch our fish. So they had, could have set a rule. Now, once you've actually been through this, you can actually set a rule to say, once our effort gets up past where our catch is, for example, we know we're in trouble. And so we have to reduce the TAC. That's the only thing that we're gonna do. That's a very simple example of a decision rule. So they would be tracking that effort. They would be getting their catch every year, no problem. But as soon as it took them too much effort, all of a sudden, they already know what's coming next. The decision's already been made. We're gonna cut our TACs by 30%, for example. So um, that is an example of a decision rule. Um, is there any, any questions about that? Because I've just glossed over harvest strategies very quickly there. All right, cool. Ecologically sustainable harvest. All right, so as I spoke about before, we, we don't just look at what is the virgin biomass from the population um, and, and what is the current status of the, the population. We don't like them being down around 20%. And in particular, we don't like them being around 20% because it also can affect the, um, the ecology of the other animals around them. Like I said, it's not just one stock that we're looking at. So ecological sustainable harvest looks at when I harvest this animal, what impact is it having on other animals that are dependent on it? Then what impact am I having on the species that I catch with it, like bycatch, et cetera here? Uh, so for example, a trawl fishery, you know, prawn, prawn trawling, probably only about a third of the catch is prawns. The rest of it is a whole range of other species. So you have to monitor that stuff. Um, the endangered, threatened, protected species that I talked about before, uh, and also the impacts on habitats and ecosystems. We have some really ugly practices that have occurred historically um, in fishing. So up the top left there, that's dynamite fishing. And sadly, dynamite fishing occurred fairly extensively throughout Asia. I'd like to think that the practice is mostly gone. Um, shark finning. So we can see here, and you would have all heard about shark finning. Um, shark fins, an incredibly popular uh, shark fin soup, an incredibly popular delicacy in many Asian countries. And so unfortunately, a lot of sharks are harvested and their fins are removed and thrown back overboard. That's because the carcass itself is worth very little money, but the fins are worth a lot. And so if it's a bycatch, they'll keep the fins, just kill the shark, throw it over the side. We've done a lot of work, NGOs and managers and scientists around the world and fishermen in trying to, to ban shark finning. And we've done a very good job of it in Australia. Practices like this, this is trawl gear. You can see a, a bottom trawler over rocky, hard substrates. Again, this is Asia, um, doesn't occur at all in Australia, um, but these types of practices do and have occurred uh, in other parts of the world, unfortunately. And up above, we can see the turtle caught in the drift nets. And, and we, I think you probably have heard of many of the different things around drift netting in particular. Um, we, have, we do have drift nets, but there, there is a lot of regulations and restrictions around them. And we monitor to make sure that uh, that the interactions with endangered and threat protected species are minimal and that they, that they don't cause any damage to the population. And there are ways of doing that. You know, there's things that you can do. Um, the amount of soak time, for example, you know, it, um, inevitably in fisheries, some animals that you don't wanna catch will get caught. But the whole objective is A, to make sure that the level of impact of any fishery is not going to affect that population and B, that you are doing everything possible to minimize the impact. But unfortunately, things like turtles, whales, dugongs, all of those types of animals do get um, killed as a, an artifact of fishing. A few other examples. So prawn trawl bycatch, um, as I said to you before, many of the prawn fisheries in Australia are MSC certified. So things like seahorses are monitored to make sure again that the population's okay, 
and that we're not catching too many of them. And when they are caught, that they are released over, over the side straight away. Um, we make sure individually that out of all of those diversity of fish species, um, I've been involved myself in studies in Spencer Gulf, where we literally took samples um, from every single catch around a whole range of areas. We did it about every four or five years. And we did a full risk assessment where we studied every single species and we looked at um, the biology of those species and the likelihood of the risk of the fishery, uh, how much they caught and how it was likely to impact that stock. The same stuff as stock sustainability for a target species. And we did that on every single species that was caught by the Spencer Gulf prawn fishery in, in more of a risk-based framework because you can't, you can't run a model for all of these things. Um, but, we, but you can look at the elements of the biology to make sure the ones that are most vulnerable, um, that you aren't harming those. Turtles, so many year, for many years, um, the prawn fishery killed an unreasonable number of turtles until they brought in turtle excluder devices. And so now they have these devices built into the trawl where um, there's these large bars and any uh, large shark or stingray or turtle that hits the bars basically slides straight up and out of the net and never gets touched. So um, turtle excluder devices were awesome. Sea snakes, we monitor sea snakes. They do catch quite a few again in, in some of the prawn fisheries, um, but those guys come up alive and, uh, and they get returned alive. So they're very good at looking after them. So, um, all right, that's a jewfish, by the way, just a, a very large jewfish that was a part of the bycatch so on one of our things. All right, prawn fisheries in South Australia. As I said uh, before, I've been involved in South Australian prawn fishery research for about eight years. Spencer Gulf, amazing. That first picture that I showed with the 39 boats that all work together, really incredible. You can see the blue lines up the top there um, is the, the amount of catch that the Spencer Gulf prawn fishery has been able to maintain since it first started. That is because they collaborate together, they work well, and they're not greedy. And they've set up decision rules and now they're MSC certified. The red bars is the amount of trawl effort that they have put in over time. And when you divide the trawl effort, uh, sorry, the total catch by the trawl effort, we call that catch per unit effort. You can see that little black line has increased over time. So now they do less days and they catch more fish. So everybody's happy because they're far more efficient and the stocks are safe and sustainable. But it takes decision rules to do that because otherwise, if you didn't have decision rules around it, they might just keep putting in the same amount of effort and then they would start overfishing it. But these guys have been fishing at or around MSY for pretty much their whole history. Really impressive. Over here in the Gulf St. Vincent, there are 10 fishes. Um, they don't operate so well with government. They have had a bit of a checkered history uh, of trying to argue with government the whole time. Uh, I also think though, that they've had some impacts from the environment that Spencer Gulf hasn't suffered. So Adelaide is right on the Gulf St. Vincent there. And I think that the reality is that the impacts on water quality and seagrass habitats and things like that have unfortunately impacted the Gulf St. Vincent fishery. But the reality is when they started, you can see the catch graph on A there. They started and they went up and they took too much and then it came right down. It had to be closed for two years. Then it recovered. I started with them back here. We implemented surveys and tried to do what was done in the Spencer Gulf um, and things went look, looking good. And then they started to drop back down again and we tried to get them to stop, but they political pressure, um, they just kept putting in too much effort and it went back down again. And it's just been bouncing up and down this whole time. All I'm trying to show you here is that you can, be looking, you can be harvesting the same animal next door to each other in very similar environments. But if, if you don't have the right science and management and policy and harvest strategy decision rules underpinning it, then you can get two very, very different outcomes. That's pretty amazing. But where stakeholders and fishers work together with science and management, you always get a much, much better outcome. I've spent a fair bit of time in Asia. So I've been to, uh, I've been to China um, to present uh, about four or five years ago, went to China. Uh, I've spent time in Thailand, um, three or four times I've been to Thailand. 
I worked in Vietnam on what's called a fishery improvement project, which is um, where they, they have assessed the fishery against the MSC standard, and then they try to work on all the different elements um, to try to improve their fisheries over time. And so uh, that was a three-year project. That was in the blue crab fishery in Vietnam, which is, is where these pictures come from. Um, just as an example, some of the challenges, you know, in Vietnam, they are beautiful people. It was amazing. It was one of my favorite places that I've ever been to. And they used three different types of gear, but one in particular caught a lot of really small crabs. And I went over to them and said, look, here's your problem. You know, you, you really got to stop catching these. You can use your drift nets and everything. They catch all the big crabs, but these pots you're using, they catch way too many small crabs and you're really affecting your, your future. Those crabs, were, or those pots were the things that were used by the majority of fishermen. And in the end of the day, the fishery improvement project fell over because they're, they're, they really are a beautiful people. They did not want to enforce on people to remove all their gear and they couldn't afford them. They couldn't afford them to do that. Um, and unfortunately, um, those stocks have continued to go down. Um, and it's a bit of a sad situation, but sometimes, you know, even with the best, uh, the best advice, the best hope sometimes things just get in the way and uh, and it became a job too difficult so but i think probably what will happen is that blue crabs are a pretty resilient animal um, many of those fishermen will probably have to find other work and all that sort of stuff and then maybe at some point in time the stocks will bounce back and they'll be able to have a better basis for management um, but uh you know asia is is problematic um a lot of the time they didn't start with really good fisheries management um a lot of the time what actually happened was that production companies from places like the US came in and funded the fishermen to go out catching all of the fish and they set up all the supply chains and everything. So there was no real management framework around it. Fortunately, they're catching up on that now. And so all of these countries throughout Asia, they all have um, fisheries legislation. They all have rules and regulations. They've still got a lot of improvements to make, but at least they're on the right pathway. So my time in the World Wildlife Fund, as I, I mentioned, WWF, not the World Wrestling Federation, um, I worked on, uh, I worked with coals and it was this concept of market transformation. And this wine glass here is a little theory that uh, they used around market transformation. And that is that the top of the wine glass is where we have consumers and there are 7 billion um, you know, potential consumers. What's the chances of being able to make, you know, sustainability changes by trying to educate 7 billion people about what a sustainable stock is? It's not going to happen. Down the bottom, we've got the primary producers. So there are actually 1.5 billion people involved in the fishing or seafood industry, um, according, to, according to these figures. So trying to educate all of those and actually operate at the Fisher level is also you know, a very difficult driver. So what they did was they worked on the supply chain because there are far fewer companies that are involved in all the buying and the production, et cetera. And, and where WWF went to was to work with Coles initially. And so Coles set up, uh, Coles went through, I, I think I might have a slide on it, but they, you, you've, we'll have seen ads most recently that Coles are saying, they're, they're announcing that they want to be the most, you know, seen as the most sustainable seafood, oh, sorry, the sustainable um, supermarket chain in Australia. And it's the first time they've actually advertised what they have been doing actively for at least 10 years. And I've worked with them for the last uh, probably eight now. And, and they have invested heavily. They, they started out with... Um, grass-fed beef, which is a whole, um, oh, sorry, hormone-free beef, which was a whole program, uh, animal welfare program around um, beef. It wasn't just about removing the hormones, but it was a whole animal welfare program. They did the cage-free eggs and they worked with, um, they worked with RSPCA to develop uh, a new level that was below um, free range, but was well above cage. And so they, they've operated with all of these groups to try to transform markets and seafood was their toughest one. They went in and the seafood supply chain is ridiculous. Like it'll have, uh, for, for an example, 
one dozen oysters at one point in time that was um, grown in Tasmania went through six different suppliers before it actually reached Coles, the Coles market. So it can be very complex, um, very, very complex. But um, what Coles has done is that they have, they have tried and what WWF were aiming to do was to try to work with Coles to sell a sustainable seafood um, uh, model, basically. And so they have invested a hell of a lot of money over over time and i'll show a couple of pictures in this um actually i'll go through that one and so i've worked with them now for like i said eight years on their responsibly sourced seafood program and so when you go to the coles counter uh anything that's in their deli um in the deli counters or anything that has coles brand like that um will have the responsible sourced seafood um logo and so basically what we do is we assess the fishery it's a bit like an MSC assessment. It's a cut down version of that. And we do it fairly rapidly. But when we first started, uh, when I first started with the World Wildlife Fund, they assessed 250 different lines of seafood products that went through Coles. It was an enormous task. When we identified all of that, there was a whole range of them that were quite unsustainable, like from Asian fisheries and things like that. And they were problematic. They weren't going to be able to improve enough in time. So to Coles credit, they just said, we're going to stop sourcing them. And so they only now source from things that we demonstrate, myself as MRAG um, today, that we, that we demonstrate and report as sustainable against the criteria that is effectively the same as, as the Marine Stewardship Council, MSC. And so Coles and MSC have, have worked together for quite a few years and Coles aim to sell as much MSC certified product as what they possibly can. And so here you've got the, the hokey fillets, the New Zealand um, hokey fillets. Um, that's that fishery that I said before is 120,000 tonnes of hokey caught out of New Zealand every year. That forms the basis of a lot of the white fish products that you'll see in places like Coles. Okay. And so um, I won't go on too much more about it, but that's been a really interesting part of my work and a very big part of my life for the last eight years. One other element, and I'm pretty much at the end now. Um, I talked before about the, the fishery improvement project uh, that I did in Vietnam. Well, one resource for you, if you wanna look up and understand about international fisheries is called Fishery Progress. And fisheryprogress.org is another ENGO um, that's being developed. And these things called fishery improvement projects um, take all various forms and shapes. But the idea of fishery improvement projects, it was another market transformation thing. Effectively, suppliers, large suppliers said, we will no longer source from any fishery unless it is either like MSC certified or has some label or is in a fishery improvement project because they want to know that these guys are demonstrating improvement over time. And fishery improvement projects, like I say, they take all different shapes and sizes, but they effectively, they need to be demonstrating that they are constantly improving in terms of assessing the stocks, assessing and looking after the environment and developing improved policies. This website can is a, is a um, database that contains, I, I can't remember what the number is now, but it would, is probably around a couple of hundred at least fishery improvement projects that are conducted around the world. And each fishery improvement project manager needs to be able to report onto the fishery progress website what their progress is and assessment against time. So if you're looking for projects and things to be able to, um, to, be able to review on international fisheries, this is a fantastic resource, okay? It gives you a bit of an understanding of the diversity of the types of things that are going on as well. Um, M Orange Ruffy is, I don't know if anybody knows about this. I'm, I'm going to proudly promote this story. Um, I was involved in the, uh, in the attempted MSC certification of the Orange Ruffy fishery. Unfortunately, due to a technicality, it ended up in, uh, in falling over. But um, this ugly animal is, is a very delicious white fleshed fish and Prior to the, uh, I think it was around the 1980s, um, 
the mid to late 1980s, thousands and thousands of tonnes of these fish were caught um, without much management out off, South Australia, uh, off Southern Australia. Those animals live to about 150 years old. So these amazing deep stocks, they, they scatter all around in the depths of the ocean and then they aggregate over these large pinnacles that are still like three or four kilometres down, mind you, like really, really deep water. But an area, say, the size of a football field um, that's like an underwater mountain and the orange roughy aggregate to spawn over the top of those. And that had obviously been going on for a very long period of time without any intervention. And then fishermen came along, caught some of these guys, a market developed, and it just went nuts. It went crazy. And they would catch so many fish all at once because of they're all in this spawning aggregation that trawl, the trawl nets would burst because there was too many. And then thousands of, of tons of dead fish floating on the sea. It was disgusting. It was terrible. And it was a, a blight on fisheries management in Australia. And when they realized that they were catching too much and the catch rates were starting to drop, they closed all the fisheries down and they shut it down for 15, 20 years. And they were saying, well, might not ever reopen these things again. But what they did is they started investing in science and they went out and they started doing acoustic biomass surveys where they would, they would run these probes down basically and, and use like huge depth sounders to actually estimate um, the volumes of fish. And so it was another fishery independent survey method. And they would do that over time. And they actually saw that the numbers were increasing and so deep and savory processes and things like that had kicked in or the recruitment was still filling up those numbers. And they realized that, you know what, we can actually fish this stock in a sustainable manner. So over time, they developed a really good population model and they have taken really conservative harvest strategies. And every year they go out and they measure these things annually. And they take a very, very limited catch. Like, uh, I can't remember what the numbers are, but it's like 2% of what they were catching back in the old days, but it's still a viable fishery. I think they catch a, a thousand tons or a couple of thousand tons a year and they get good money for it. And those guys wanted to be on MSC certified. As I said, unfortunately it fell over um, due to a technicality in the MSC system, not due to any other reason, but it's actually should be a poster boy for good Australian fisheries management. So a very ugly fish, but a very tasty fish. And hopefully one day it gets back onto the markets and the main markets. But that's the sort of thing, again, that, uh, that I've been involved in. And uh, yeah, so I think I'll, I'll leave it there. Um, so uh, yeah, again, thank you for listening. Hopefully you've learned a bit. And uh, I've certainly had a very diverse history, like I say, but uh, it's been such a rewarding career. Um, and anybody that wants to get into marine science or fishery science, I can yeah, certainly say, don't do it for the money, but you can do it for the job. So cool. No other questions?